Ah, there you are. Now then, you don't have to travel miles away to find a piece of history that's worth talking about. One way to do it is just go to your local churchyard and have a look at the graves, see if you can find any war graves, and then look into the stories behind them. In my village cemetery, I found a captain that landed on the beaches of D-Day, and a Battle of Britain fighter pilot with a bit of a story to tell. His name was Brian Meeker, and his story, along with that of 249 Squadron, is one that's worth telling. The Battle of Britain was a pivotal moment in the fighting on the Western Front of World War II. The miracle of Dunkirk had ensured that Britain had most of our army back in England, but very little equipment to defend our island. Most of Europe had fallen to the Blitzkrieg. America wasn't in the war yet. It was known that Hitler had plans to invade. Ireland was neutral. Britain was alone. Britain was the key to the future liberation of Europe. This tiny speck in the North Atlantic was the one hope the Western world had of pushing the Nazis back to Berlin. If Britain fell, where would D-Day be launched from? New York? What became known as the Battle of Britain started in July 1940, and the fighting got fiercer and fiercer as both sides committed more aircraft to the fray. On the 15th of September 1940, Churchill himself was observing the control room of Eleven Group and asked Air Vice Marshal Keith Park how many fighters he had in reserve. Park said, None, I'm putting in my last. Churchill's heart sank. For almost an hour, every single available fighter in Britain was in the air holding back the German fighters and bombers. If they were shot down, there were none to replace them. If they ran out of ammunition or fuel and had to land, there would be none in the air fighting and could be destroyed much easier on the ground. For 50 minutes, you could argue that the fate of Europe hung by a tiny thread in the skies over Britain. Later, it was said of Air Vice Marshal Park that he could have lost the war that afternoon. One of the most decorated squadrons in the thick of the fighting was 249 Squadron RAF. Formed at the very end of the First World War, they'd been disbanded and then reformed in May 1940. One of their members would go down in history as the only Victoria Cross awarded to a fighter pilot in the Second World War. 249's motto was punches and kicks, meaning they'd fight with everything they had, no holds barred. It's fair to say the squadron lived up to its motto, and what follows is just a few of their stories. When you look up pictures of pilots of the Battle of Britain, you might find this picture. It shows around half the pilots of 249 Squadron. It's highly staged and posed, but it's good for morale and propaganda. Squadron leader Grandy here spent a lot of time poaching the best pilots from University Air Squadrons, and any pilot not worth his salt was sent away for further training. If you were kept in 249, you were good. Tom Neal here learnt to fly almost as soon as he was old enough. George Barclay had learnt to fly in the Cambridge University Air Squadron, and this chap on the end is Percy Burton, and he'd learnt to fly at Oxford University's Air Squadron. Here's another picture of him with fellow 249 pilot James Meeker, commonly known as Brian. These pictures were taken on the 21st of September 1940 and would turn out to be quite fateful. Let's start with Meeker. James Reginald Brian Meeker was born in County Cork, Ireland in 1919. Around the age of three, he and his parents moved to England when Ireland became independent. They lived in West Dean and he attended Chichester High School for Boys, and later became an editor for the Chichester Observer in charge of the Midhurst district. I went to school in Midhurst and now live in West Dean myself. On the 26th of June 1939, Mika joined the Royal Air Force on a short service commission. Being born in a neutral country meant he didn't have to join up, but he did so nonetheless. Around the end of February 1940, he was flying in a formation of gladiators when one of them got too close and cut his tail off. He gave an interview to his own newspaper, The Observer, in which he told the tale of having to parachute to safety and was awarded a Caterpillar badge. Sources differ as to whether Mika went to Norway with his squadron early in 1940, but on the 7th of June 1940 the squadron returned to Britain by sea on board HMS Furious, ready to defend Britain against invasion. It's worth mentioning here that the day after his squadron sailed back to England, Another British aircraft carrier, HMS Glorious, was attacked and sunk by the battleships Scharnhorst and Gneisenau. Mika had cheated death twice before he'd even started fighting in the Battle of Britain. 
Around the end of May or the beginning of June 1940, Mika transferred to 249 Squadron Flying Hurricanes, with mixed success initially. On the 27th of June, he made a crash landing after his landing gear failed to deploy. When formed, 249 Squadron consisted of 12 pilots in two flights of six, and any more pilots that joined would be spares to replace those off duty or injured, etc. Bad luck comes in threes, and on the 16th of July, 249 had some very bad luck in the space of a few minutes. First, Mika took off around midnight and crashed into a marker post on, in the darkness. Then, Sergeant Main suffered an engine fire on takeoff. Then, Pilot Officer Neil took off and found his radio was dead and got lost in the dark. Mika was shaken but unhurt. Neil got his radio working and made it home safely. Main, however, was killed when his engine caught fire and he crashed. 249's first casualty of the war wasn't even at the hands of the enemy. In August 1940, 249 was based at North Weald and met the Duke of Kent, who coincidentally would be killed in a plane crash two years later. Here's Mika with the other chaps smoking their pipes. Except for Mika, who's smoking a tent peg mallet. Mmm, I must do this more often. On the 6th of September, squadron leader Grandy, Mika's CO, had a shell explode in his cockpit which cracked his goggles, cut his face and partially blinded him. While bailing out, he blacked out and woke up with one leg wrapped around his ear. This meant ripped muscles in his legs, and when he landed he was in agony and bleeding. A local man saw him and initially didn't approach, fearing he was a jerry, but when he shouted the words, For God's sake, call an ambulance and get this f***ing parachute off me, he was satisfied that he was a Brit. The next day, Mika and another pilot by the name of Loeth were sent to collect their squadron leader from Maidstone. Having collected the boss, Loeth drove like a lunatic back to North Weald, as there was an air raid on. They got as far as the Blackwall Tunnel when incendiary bombs started dropping on them. Grandy was rather miffed at having been blown up in the air, and now the Bosch were trying to burn him on the ground as well. Mika and Loeth had had to run for cover to avoid all the incendiary bombs, and Mika came across a guy leaning against a lamppost. Um, he asked him what he was doing standing there in the middle of an air raid. I'm waiting for the pub to open, was the reply. Sadly, back at North Weald, bad luck had struck again in threes. 249 had suffered its third fatality. Pilot Officer Fleming, known as Boost, had been shot down and horribly burnt. He died later that day from a mixture of shock and blood loss. Two other pilots were injured and out of action for some time. Despite the constant threat of death by being shot, burnt or plummeting to earth, Mika seems to have really enjoyed flying. At no point in his diary or reports does he mention being particularly scared. At least twice in his diary he notes that he's feeling more cocky and obviously gaining confidence in his flying ability. In one diary entry he describes flying on his own straight into a formation of HE-111s. He broke away and the aircraft went into a spin. He pulled out of it but then said, can't find the fighter at all after that, so I go home fed up. Mika's section leader was called Robert Barton. Known as Butch to his friends, he was born in Canada and he and Mika would ambush enemy aircraft taking it in turns to fire at enemy aircraft and formations. Both their reports mention one another quite a lot. The 15th of September was to be D-Day for Germany. Masses of aircraft were sent across the channel to hammer the RAF into submission and with that done the invasion was to begin. 249 was scrambled several times and miraculously suffered only one pilot wounded. They claimed nine enemies destroyed and nine damaged. Two of them destroyed and two of them damaged went to Mika by himself. The combat report afterwards asked how 249 was so successful, and one of the reasons given was disinclination due perhaps to the fact that there were more of our fighters about than they were wont to see. The Germans thought the RAF was shattered and Britain was on its knees, but 249 Squadron just saw more targets. Five air victories makes you an ace, and from the 15th of August to the 27th of September, Mika personally shot down seven enemy aircraft, possibly eight according to some accounts, and helped damage or destroy four others. On the 25th of September, he and another pilot, Tom Neal, were told they were to become the first members of 249 to be decorated and would both be awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. Tom Neal wrote, In my view, Brian Mika especially deserve recognition. A quiet, unobtrusive boy several years older than myself. He had been one of the first to arrive on the squadron, with seven or eight hundreds to his credit, had been involved in every major engagement from the start. 
On the morning of the 27th of September, Mika helped destroy an ME-110. He landed and wrote his report. I have a copy of that report here. Um, and you get the impression it was written in a bit of a rush. It's um, a bit more of a scrawl than previous combat reports. Um, he was probably still buzz buzzing with excitement, having just you know been in action and landed and eager to get back up there. Um, also, he might have been quite anxious because he'd heard that another member of 249 had had a collision at low altitude and was now missing. That afternoon, he was back in the air. He attacked a group of five JU-88s by himself. Knowing that each aircraft carried four crew and around one and a half tons of explosive, he pressed his attack because every aircraft shot down meant fewer enemy pilots in the air and less damage to civilians in strategic locations. Unfortunately, Mika was caught in a crossfire from all five aircraft. It's possible that he himself was hit, but his hurricane was on fire and he, he did manage to bail out. A hurricane was reported crashing in Dorlington, East Sussex. No pilot was found, so a search began. At a quarter to eight that evening, Mika was found two miles away in Brightling Park. A large gash across his forehead suggests he hit the tailplane of his aircraft as he bailed out. He was found next to an unopened parachute. Having cheated death several times in just a few months, his luck had finally run out. He was just 21 years old. So this report, although it's only a copy, was written by him the day he died, and he's buried in my local churchyard. You know, it's, it's only a copy, but it is his actual handwriting. Um, being this close to history, it's... It's what gets historians excited, you know, you're holding a piece of history. Mika lived in my village, he worked in the town I went to school in, and then he died in the skies over his home county of Sussex. A fellow member of 249, Pilot Officer George Barclay, wrote, Poor old Pilot Officer Brian Mika, DFC. Got shot down and was killed near battle. A great loss. He was one of the best. Barclay himself was shot down in action that day, along with Mika's section leader, Butch Barton. Tom Neal, his fellow DFC recipient, wrote afterwards, The imperishable, imperturbable Brian. It seemed impossible that he should have gone. So what about the other chap in the picture with Mika at the start? Percival Ross Frames Burton was born in South Africa, the son of a former South African finance minister. He studied law at Oxford, was on the university rowing team and also learned to fly while there. He joined, joined 249 a few days after Mika and had much excitement of his own. One incident happened on the 26th of August when he landed with a broken tailwheel. Around the 1st of September, bad luck once again struck 249 in threes. Burton claimed a probable kill on a DO-17 before being hit by another and his engine cut out at 10,000 feet. Another pilot had been forced to bail out and another had been shot in the neck. They all survived that day, with Burton managing to glide down from 10,000 feet with no engine and no undercarriage. Around the 25th of September, he was promoted to flying officer, and the next day he claimed another Dornier 17 killed. On the morning of the 27th of September 1940, Burton was also in the sky, along with Mika, fighting back waves of bombers and fighters, and he too claimed a victory that day. He was seen by the Observer Corps to be hounding a particularly tricky ME-110 that he followed at treetop height for 40 miles before eventually running out of ammunition. Burton himself was hit multiple times by the ME-110's machine guns and began to lose a lot of blood. A fellow pilot tells of seeing him contorting in the cockpit as rounds penetrated his body. Realising he probably wasn't going to survive, he made one last-ditch manoeuvre. The German pilot turned out to be the commander of his unit and had four victories to his name. Being so close to his target, Burton would have seen the victory markings on the enemy's tail, and in his last moments Burton thought he would put a stop to it. Out of ammunition, and now running out of time, blood and consciousness, Burton threw his hurricane into a violent turn and rammed the ME-110, cutting its tail clean off. Civilians on the ground watched in a mix of horror and excitement as both aircraft dropped out of the sky in pieces. The German plane crashed into a field, killing the crew, and Burton's hurricane hit an oak tree. He was thrown clear and found riddled with bullets. 
Some accounts say he died in the arms of the locals, but most think he was already dead. The recently promoted flying officer was just 23 years old, and there were whispers of the Victoria Cross. George Barclay noted in his diary that Burton was a very careful pilot, very cautious in the air, so for him to have been hit didn't bode well for the rest of the squadron. On the 8th of October 1940, Brian Meeker was posthumously awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. His parents accepted the award from the King at a ceremony in London. His citation read, Pilot Officer Meeker has shot down at least five enemy aircraft and damaged others. Resolute in attack, with a calm, determined temperament, his leadership has been an example to his squadron. He lies buried at St Andrew's Church in his home village of West Dean in West Sussex. On the 15th of November, it was announced that a member of 249 was being awarded the Victoria Cross, but it wasn't to Burton. Flight Lieutenant Nicholson was awarded the only fighter pilot VC of the entire war for heroics back in August. He would continued firing at an enemy aircraft despite his hurricane being on fire and having been shot in the foot and badly burnt. Burton received a mention in dispatches instead and was buried at St Andrew's Church in Tangmere, just five miles as the hurricane flies from where Meeker is buried. This picture was taken less than a week before their demise. Here are two men who were not born in Britain, but they both volunteered to serve in the RAF. They flew together, they ate together, they slept together, in the same room that is. They fought together, and on the 27th of September 1940, they died together, just a few hours and 13 miles apart, defending Britain against invasion. That day turned out quite bleak for 249 Squadron as a whole. Although 20 enemy aircraft had been damaged or destroyed, they had lost two pilots killed, two pilots forced down, another pilot shot in the foot, who somehow managed to land with a boot full of blood, and seven hurricanes now unserviceable. That's around half the squadron out of action, and one-sixth killed. The Battle of Britain continued for another month, but the threat of invasion had subsided by the end of October, and Hitler would switch to attacking Russia instead. After the battle, Churchill made his famous speech, in which he said that never had so much been owed by so many to so few. The Battle of Britain pilots became known as the Few, and it's largely thanks to their determination and sacrifice that Britain was spared the jackboot and the swastika. So what became of the other members of 249 that I've mentioned along the way? George Barclay, who was shot down on the same day Mika died, continued serving and just a month later was awarded the DFC himself. In September 1941, he was shot down over France, evaded capture, escaped to Spain, returned to the UK and flew again. In July of 1942, he was shot down over Egypt and killed during the first battle of El Alamein. James Nicholson, the only fighter pilot to be awarded the Victoria Cross in World War II, spent months recovering from burns and shrapnel before returning to service. He died on the 2nd of May 1945 when flying as a passenger and the aircraft caught fire over the Bay of Bengal. His body was never recovered. Tom Neal, the man who, along with Mika, became the first member of 249 to be recognised for bravery, went on to a hell of a career. He was awarded his DFC in October 1940, and then another one the next month. By the end of the war, he'd claimed 14 enemy aircraft. He received a chest full of medals and retired from the RAF in 1964 at the rank of Wing Commander. He died in 2018, just three days short of his 98th birthday. John Grandy, the squadron leader who awoke in mid-air with one of his legs wrapped round his head, was taken off flying duties for some time and pushed up the ranks. He finally retired from the RAF in 1971 with the most senior rank possible, Marshal of the Royal Air Force, and a chest full of medals. He died in 2004, just a week short of his 91st birthday. Butch Barton, Mika's section leader, who was shot down the day Mika died, took command of 249 after Grandy left, and led them through the fighting over Malta. He served with distinction throughout the war, and in 1945 helped set up the Pakistani Air Force. He retired in 1959 with the rank of Wing Commander, and died on the 2nd of September 2010, aged 94. Thirteen days later was the 70th anniversary of the Battle of Britain Day, and his ashes were scattered on his favourite lake in British Columbia. We can only speculate what great things both Mika and Burton might have achieved had they survived just a bit longer. When Mika's parents died in the 1960s and 1970s, they were buried at his feet in the cemetery. 
249 Squadron can claim one of the highest kill counts in the Battle of Britain, and their medal count is astounding, including one Victoria Cross and very nearly a second. They were made up of men from several countries, including Britain, Canada, America, South Africa, Rhodesia, New Zealand, Australia, Poland, France, and even had a Fijian amongst their ranks. 249 served throughout the war, fighting in Malta, Italy, France, and the Balkans. After the war, they served in the Middle East, Cyprus, and Oman, and they were finally disbanded in 1969. The running elephant of 249 Gold Coast Squadron was laid to rest, but their name and number live on, because in the year 2000, their number was given to an air cadet detachment in Hailsham, just a few yards from where Percy Burton, the Oxford law student from South Africa, made his last gallant act 60 years earlier. Around 100 yards from my house lies buried a highly skilled pilot with an impressive record and promising future career cut short by an accident in the air. In his short time in service, he cheated death multiple times, but he continued to put himself in harm's way when he didn't have to. He could have stayed out of the war and stuck to his desk job, but he didn't. I urge you, go out into your churchyards, find war graves, and find out the history behind the men and women who served and often died for their country. Find out who they were, what they did, and you might be surprised how close you are to a piece of history. So, was, battle, was the Battle of Britain a victory? Was Dunkirk a victory? Not in the usual sense, no. We didn't push Germany back at any point, we just stopped their advance. But when an enemy is trying to eradicate you, your country, your culture, and everything you hold dear, Survival is all that matters. We survived the Battle of Britain thanks to the actions of men and boys like Brian Meeker and Percy Burton. Britain wouldn't win a proper victory until the end of 1942, two years later, and that wouldn't have been possible had those 3,000 men of Fighter Command not succeeded in the summer of 1940. The Battle of Britain saved the country from invasion, it kept us in the war, and gave the Allies somewhere to launch the liberation of Europe five years later. The lives and actions of men and women who served and died during this period are stories that are worth retelling. 